I could have my cousins, Phil and Denise, and I'm going to say this real quick. They serve in Ukraine. Uh, they have done three terms, or in the middle of their third term there in Seoul, but I will go ahead. And so let's give them a warm welcome this morning. Thank you, Pastor Micah. It is a joy to be here today. We are just thrilled to be able to spend time with my much younger cousin. Um, the, the way it works is that his youngest sister is the youngest cousin in the family, and I'm the oldest one. So I got him beat by 25 years, so you know, just, just a couple years difference. Um, but I, I know this about Pastor Laura and Pastor Micah is that they love Jesus, and they love you. And we had a lot of fun at family camp this summer with them. We, were at, we had a cabin very close by, so we had a lot of fun seeing them on a regular basis and got to know their kids a little more. So that was fun, but it's a joy to be here today. Last time I was here, about three and a half years ago, my wife was not with me. Our youngest daughter was a senior in high school then, and she stayed home. Uh, so it was just me, and now you get to know the nice half of us. So this is kind of good. <laughs> um, it's true. Uh, she's the nice one, I will not lie. Um, and uh, anyway, so God is faithful. Uh, I want to say thank you for your faithful partnership with us in prayer, especially, and in finances. Uh, Pastor Mike already mentioned that you prayed for us when we left Ukraine. Uh, it feels like a lifetime ago, but it was only the end of February when we left Ukraine. And uh, we're going to talk about that experience today a little bit, because I think you need to understand... Um, a little bit about what we went through, and, and, and for part of that is my sermon's about obedience to God. So if you don't want to hear that sermon, get up and go now, because I'm just telling you, it's not a light, light fluffy sermon like I would like to preach. So, uh, And then also, thank you for praying for us when I had cancer two years ago. I was going through chemotherapy for lymphoma, and now I'm healthy, and I thank God it's been over a year and a half, and the doctor said at the two-year point, the, the chances of that coming back drop way down. So I'm not worried about it at all. I wasn't worried about it then. So God is, God is faithful. You know that. And it doesn't matter if life is hard or life is easy. God is always faithful. He never changes. So, all right, next slide. So in Ukraine, uh, what we were doing before we left and what we hope to do when we go back is we're working with a group of churches called Churches of Praise. And they are a charismatic group of churches who... Uh, they, they want to grow, okay? And so we visit church, different church every Sunday, which uh, I have lived a very itinerant lifestyle for a homebody. It's kind of unusual. And what I find is that the pastors in rural settings are lonely. And they love having somebody around. So we get to spend time with pastors and leaders in the church and trying to help the churches be healthy so they can actually start new churches. Next slide. And then the fun thing we get to do is youth ministry. Uh, like I said, I'm 58 years old, and I am enjoying spending time with young people. Because I feel like I have something I can pass on to them. I've lived a few years. I've experienced a few things. And sometimes I can say to them, I know if you keep down that path, this is what's going to happen. And a few months later, they come back to me and say, how did you know? Experience. Not mine. Somebody else's, thankfully. <laughs> because I've always lived for Jesus. So, um, and, and I think that it's really important for us to share that because Jesus wants us to make disciples. And part of that is sharing our experience, sharing our knowledge, sharing our wisdom that we have. And so my wife and I are mama and papa to a lot of young people. And she's the master chef who makes yummy cookies, American cookies that they just think are the best, which they are, of course. And, uh, yeah, it's just a lot of fun. I spend a lot of time mentoring, trying to do some of that from here. But it's a little harder when you're across the ocean because a lot of guys don't like to write. And so I'll say, how are you? They'll say, I'm fine. How are you? And I'm fine is kind of the answer. But I try to ask very specific questions to get good answers. So next slide. So Kiev is the top box there in blue. And that we lived there for a year back in 2004. 14 and 15, and I did not like it there because there's like 3 million people at that time living in Kiev, and that's a little too big for this small town kid from Grand Rapids. So, and then the green box is Kriway Road. That is the city where we've lived in most of the time we've been overseas. And it is a long, skinny city. It's 80 miles long and 20 miles wide, which is, you know, just imagine 80 miles long. Anyway, but... What? Oh, and it's, it's also the Iron Range of Ukraine. So I feel right at home right there with 
red dirt everywhere and stuff. But uh, we love that city, even though it's a very, um, well, high crime, high drug use, high alcoholism, stuff like that. But that, a lot of pollution, yes, because they also have the, high, the largest steel mill in Europe in that city. So uh, just a lot of bad things, but you know what? It's a good place to be because people need Jesus. Amen. Uh, and so we were there when the war started on February 24th, and we drove, we wanted to go down to the Purple Box, which is Constanza, Romania. It's on the Black Sea, and we decided not to do that because the Russian soldiers were south of us, and we thought we didn't really want to meet them. So we decided to go the northern route over to Siret, Romania, which is just a tiny little village. And so normally it would take us about 20 hours to drive that. Normal. But things were not normal after the war started, and it took us 82 hours total. Um, yeah, I, it, to just the red box, it would take around 12 hours. But three-fourths of the way there, we hit a, a roadblock kind of a checkpoint. checkpoint yep. And we had to wait three hours in line for that, because you don't know what's coming up. You're just like, why is this traffic stopping? Mm -hmm. And then it, we found out it was a checkpoint. Went through that. And then we got 10 to 12 miles from the border, and that started the other line of cars. But we didn't know that line of cars was just going to the border, and it would take us two and a half days in that line. 60 hours. 60 hours. And so then every 15 minutes to an hour, we'd move anywhere from two to six car lengths ahead of time. So we had to take turns sleeping to make sure somebody was there was able to pull ahead so you didn't lose your place in line because who wants to spend any more time? It's bad enough three hours, let alone um, two and a half days. And the people in front of you and behind you, get, we get to, after a little while, you get to know each other a little bit better. So one time we did fall asleep, but the guy behind us knocked on our window and scared us to death and then we went pulled forward. <laughs> so thank God he did that. And, um, we, I brought food with us. We always travel with food when it's more than two or three hours, and we still bring a little bit in. So we have food with us for the two and a half days, but the Red Cross did have th people alongside the road to give you food. Sometimes they wouldn't wait for you to come and get it, so they would bring it to you, sandwiches and different things. So that was really nice, and water and tea or coffee. And, but the only thing is, before when we were packing, I um, felt like we should bring a blanket. You know, you think it's winter, it's cold. If I'm going to sleep in the car, I want a blanket. Well, I thought, ah, oh, we're traveling. We're going to be leaving the car there. I don't want to leave another thing in the car that I don't have to. Well, that was a wrong decision. Because it got kind of cold when you turn the car off so you don't lose, you don't run out of gas. Because it was about 32. Yeah, it was about 32 degrees, so in the car, sitting there, it gets kind of cold. Our coats were warm, but my legs and my ankles were really cold. And um, maybe the, net, the pictures? Do we have a picture? Yep. I don't know what he does for slides sometimes. Well, during the day, while we're um, sitting there waiting, we saw <laughs> lines of people walking. We think it's from a train station behind us, and there were just lines and lines of, of people, and it was hard to think they're walking that whole way. The sad thing was, they got there before us. But they didn't get to take near as much stuff, so I would rather bring more things back to America, uh, stuff, because I didn't know if we would ever be in Ukraine again, so I wanted to bring some of those special things back with us um, from Ukraine. And so, we, we were a little more comfortable than they were. Um, the next picture, there was some students from India and Africa we saw. This is the line of cars that we looked at every two and a half days straight. And you can see they brought their pets, they, they carry their kids with them. Um, it was nice to have the red vehicle there because then even though we couldn't see beyond it unless you got out of the car, we knew if that car was lean, going farther, that van was going farther, then um, we were going to go soon. Our youngest daughter is now 21. 
she would have driven us crazy if she had been with us for two and a half days, and there would have been a child <laughs> sacrifice on the side of the road. <laughs> she admitted she would drive us crazy. And behind us, there were lots of kids in that car, so then they would get out. The nice thing about not traveling fast is that your kids can get out and play by the side of the road even though it's cold and you're not going very far, so they'll be able to find you, or you'll be able to find them. And um, so it was interesting, and FYI, I don't know if it's too much information, but um, we, God provided two bathrooms for me, well, three, uh, a gas station and a restaurant and an outhouse. And my husband says, you gotta be really desperate when you can, you consider that a bathroom. An outhouse and, is not a bathroom. And it's a squatty. All the ones in there are squatty, but I like that because then you don't touch anything. Everything's under your feet. And other than that, it was behind the bushes and the trees, but you see that it's winter. There's no leaves on the bushes and the trees. And everybody's sitting there. And Watch everybody's it. together. So it's not like the traffic's going by fast and you know nobody's gonna really see you. But you gotta do what you gotta do and we were all in it together, no matter if we wanted to or not. At one point she asked, isn't there an express line for Americans? <laughs> and I said, no, we're not that special. Yeah. A lot of times in, in certain embassies and stuff there was. Yeah. You show them your American passport and they get you right in. So maybe that's why I thought, next yep. picture. Um, this is in Ukraine. This is a pastor in the camel colored coat that we worked with, Sergei. And God asked him to travel up to four hours away from his city to go to the heavily bombed areas of Ukraine in the east, in the northeast, um, Kharkiv and Baisumi. So he went to a lot of villages there and he would bring supplies, food, medicine, all those kinds of things people didn't have because they weren't working, the stores weren't open. It's awful hard to get food if they're, you, can't, you don't have any money to buy it or if nobody's bringing it in because it's too dangerous. And so he brought at least one van, sometimes more, to go over there on really bad roads and he should have been bombed about three or four times but God protected him. And then they would preach the gospel when they brought those supplies. And that's what he's doing here, is telling them about God. And in one village, he testified that 100% of the people repented that day. Because Jesus is the only thing that can give you hope. 95% of the people are orthodox, but it's more of a religion. They just go and do good works. And that does not give you hope. And so when his vans were um, empty, there would be a line of people waiting to get out of, of that area and go back to his city and then maybe go on trains to farther west. And so he sends us hundreds of pictures with other pastors, next picture, um, to um, feed people, bring them the gospel, to provide protection one month, one, a couple months ago, I think he reported there was a family he helped get away from their house back to safety, more safety. And a month later, he went past the house and it was demolished. And the people cried and said, if you wouldn't have helped us, we would have been in our house probably because we didn't go anywhere and we would have all been dead or injured. And so other than giving spiritually, it, you gotta do the physical too. You gotta be the hands and feet of Jesus. And I've heard from both he and another, another pastor in just the last week or so that they have been to villages very close to the Russian border. And they brought in bread, medicine, candles, and a few food supplies and things like that. People are living there for over seven months without electricity, without gas, without telephone connection. They're cooking their food out on a fire outside of the front door, and they haven't seen bread for more than seven months. And when, the, when these pastors have given them bread, they just weep and cry 
because they're getting bread for the first time. They're getting their medicine that they don't have a pharmacy close by to buy them. They don't have any money to buy it either. So they're providing their physical needs and people are responding to the gospel like crazy. It is absolutely a miracle what God is doing there. Is it difficult? You better believe it's difficult. But God uses the difficult things to work his will Amen. and to turn things out for good as we as believers know that. So um, what are we planning to do? Well, we continue um, in communication with pastors there. Half of the offering that you give today is going to go directly to my pastor friend, our pastor friends, to help them with Ukraine relief, buying diesel fuel for them to be able to do that, buying medicine things like that, because it's really important. We passed on uh, in the neighborhood of $37,000 already, and it's not enough. And the needs are greater now because it's winter. If you can imagine having no heat when it's winter, um, or electricity, it's just it's very difficult. Um, I'm also working on something really interesting. We're working on an app that's hopefully gonna help disciple Ukrainians. And unfortunately, because they speak both Ukrainian and Russian, we're actually doing two apps at the same time, but I'm using something that a colleague of ours built to, um, that the structure's there. I just have to get everything translated and things like that. So I'm, I had a couple friends of mine translate some stuff. I had our landlady check it. I've been going through and double, triple checking stuff and I'm having a landlady look at it again. And then I'll be able to actually do the physical work of just copying and pasting to get stuff built in that app. And I will be ready to go to use that app. And I'm excited about what God's, how God's gonna use that. And that's going to be a lot of busy work for me, but I'm excited because two years ago when I heard about this, I was like, we need to do that in Ukraine. Of course, I didn't expect to have to do it in a hurry during the war, but you know what? It's all right. God is good. So that gives me something exciting to know. We are simply waiting on God's will for us at this point in time. We know that we're in the States for a reason. We know that we're here because God wants us here. Her parents are 90 years old. Their health is you know, kind of up and down as it gets when you're that age and stuff. And so we don't know how long they're going to be with us. We don't know exactly what's going on. We just got a picture today from our youngest daughter that she finally got engaged. So that's kind of cool. <laughs> last night, she told us this morning, of course, not last night. You know how that goes. But uh, so, yeah, so that's, that's going to be an interesting season of life for us. Next slide. Um, I handed out some prayer cards already. But if you haven't gotten one, I, I ask you to come and find me, or I'll be asking you if you've gotten one yet. I believe these are important because we cannot wait, rely on the news to tell us about, to remind us to pray for Ukraine and Ukrainians, because the news is fickle. And there's more important things that's usually in the news now that they don't talk about it very much. But we know that prayer is the most important way to affect our world and um, to see the needs of others met and it's an eternal value instead of just physical or anything else and we pray that uh, we ask that you would pray remember ukrainians no matter where they are in this world they um, face lots of trauma if not just from having to leave their country. Um, pictures, you might see men there, but most men have not left Ukraine because it was a law that if you're between 18 and 60, you cannot leave. That you can, you don't have to fight, but you can do something for the war and for the effort and helping out your country. There's a few exceptions, like if you have three small children or more or a handicapped child or something, but um, most men are still there um, taking care of their property or helping out. And that's hard on a family for this long to be without your family, um, without your loved ones. And all those women and children in different countries without their husband trying to adapt and live. And um, also pray for Russians because they don't have control over what they do in, with their country, just like we don't have control about what our leaders do. And God loves them. And some of them are facing lots of trauma also. And so we're not political. God wants everyone to be saved Amen. and to know him. Right. And so um, if you could just pray for them. Next slide. We have a website, we have a news, an electronic letter that we send out, newsletter. 
Uh, if you're interested in signing up for that, find me after service. You can get, like, get you sign up on my tablet. Next slide, and I think that's the sermon slide. All right, now we're going to ser- do a sermon. And uh, I think it's important for us to realize that obedience to God is one of the most important things that we can talk about. It sometimes, as, as this says, overcoming the giant of disobedience something is very difficult. When, when God, and, and thank you, Pastor Micah, for the opportunity to, to share today. I didn't say that publicly yet, and uh, just for the honor of preaching, it's a privilege for us. Um, we, uh, we as missionaries do not have a corner on obedience. Just because we're a missionary, just because Micah and I are pastors, does not mean that it's easy for us to obey God, any easier than for anybody else. True? Amen. We still have to fight with that. Um, back when God called me to be a missionary 15 years ago, I said to God, no way, Jose. Mm-hmm. I really did. And as God continued to speak to me, I, I, I've been a Christian since I was five years old, so I knew all the stories in the Bible. I knew I was being like Moses. I knew I didn't want to ride the Ukraine in a fish, but it was hard for me to say yes because I was a computer programmer. That's how God wired me, and I loved my job, and I just could not see myself in any role other than that. But God knows best, and I'm glad I said yes to him. When I went and talked to my wife, I said, hey, honey, guess what? God wants to be missionaries. And she goes, okay. That's a gift from God. I kind of think I kind of was hoping that she'd say no, but you know, just, <laughs> I'm glad she didn't because we're having a blast. We love this life that God has given us. Last spring, I go to the gym in Iowa City when we're down there because that's where her family is, and so I go pretty regular. And in the spring, I, I'd seen this guy for about a month, and I figured he was probably a college student at the University of Iowa, and, and I thought, well. You know, I felt like God wanted me to talk to him, and, and I'm an introvert, okay? For me to talk to a stranger really needs to, I really got to hear from God. I really have to. Anybody else like that here that's an introvert? Oh, yeah. There's a lot of us in the world. And uh, uh, that's why I was a computer programmer, because a lot of introverts become computer programmers. Anyway, and I talked to, I talked to God, and I'm like, okay, God, if you set it up so he and I are in the locker room together, and he doesn't have his earbud in his ear, then I'll talk to him. Well, y'all know that. That never happened. We were never just the two of us in the locker room. And so one day in late April, we were going to be leaving on a couple week trip, and I'm like, college is going to get done here. I need to talk to him. I'm going to. But he was there. He had his earbuds in. I'm like, a lot of people with earbuds in. So I'm like, well, whatever. I'll just leave. I get in the car, and the Holy Spirit is just talking to me. And I'm like, get in the car, start driving, and I go back and park the car, I'm like, this is so dumb. I go back inside, I tell the guy up front I forgot something, and I didn't tell him what, because I was a little embarrassed, and so I went back, tapped him on the shoulder, and I said to him, because God did not tell me what to say, he just told me, talk to him, so okay. So I said, hi, my name is Phil, I'm a follower of Jesus, and I believe God wants me to talk to you. Now that sounds like a nutty thing to say, doesn't it? But you know what? I had my answer in 10 seconds, or 10 to 15 seconds, why I was supposed to talk to him. He said to me, I don't believe in the deity, and God wants you to talk to me because, maybe God wants you to talk to me because I'm going to be a lawyer for the Satanic Temple. And I'm like, well, God, now I know. Well, it turns out he graduated with a pre-law degree, but he hasn't gone back to law school, and we have nothing in common. We're ideologically opposed in almost every area of life. The only two things that I know we have in common is we both go to the gym and we need Jesus. So I've been building a friendship with him. And hopefully when I get back to uh, Iowa City this week, I'll get to see him, talk to him a little bit, um, write to him on Facebook once in a while and check up on him. He seems to be glad to hear from me, so I'm trying to just be his friend. That's all I want to do, is just be his friend. And God will use that, I really believe it. We have to be friends with non-Christians. And sometimes that's difficult. But we should be the influencers, not the other way around. So today I want to look really briefly at a couple examples in the Bible, and then I want to 
share some of our experience this last beginning part of the year. First thing is Saul in 1 Samuel 15. This is an account of Saul's disobedience, one of many. And uh, he really struggled with that giant disobedience. In verse 1 we read that the prophet Samuel told King Saul, Now go and destroy the entire Amalekite nation. Basically, if it breeds, kill it. So Saul gathered his army and went there to destroy the army, or the, the Amalekites, sort of. In verses 8 and 9, it says that he captured the king, but completely destroyed everyone else. And then Saul and his men kept the best of everything. And the last sentence is pretty important. They destroyed everything, only what was worthless or of poor quality. Doesn't that sound like us? Well, this God could use this, this thing. I'm not, I don't want to get rid of that. Why would I kill these sheep? I could sacrifice them to God. Samuel came and found Saul, and Saul lied right away and said, I did what God asked me to do. I don't know how he thought that, but that's what he thought. And Samuel said, then, if you did what God asked, how, why do I hear the bleeding of sheep and goats? And why do I hear the lowing of cattle? And then Saul, rather than taking responsibility, he said, it's the army, they did it. Their fault. Verses 18 and 19, Samuel said to Saul, And the Lord sent you on a mission and told you, Go and completely destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, until they are all dead. Why haven't you obeyed the Lord? And this would have been a perfect place for Saul to say, I have sinned, God forgive me, right? What did he do? In verses 20 and 21, he said, But I did obey the Lord. Again, how? But we do this. We deceive ourselves into thinking that we obeyed God. And then in verse 21, he said, Then my troops brought in the best of the sheep, goats, and cattle, and plunder to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. There's the problem right there, folks. Who's God? was God. The God of Saul or the God of Samuel? The God of Samuel. So Saul was trying to serve somebody else's God and that never works. We cannot serve God through somebody else. We have to know God personally to be able to serve him. Then in verses 22 and 23 Samuel has a very powerful response. But Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice. Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice, and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft, and stubbornness is bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. In the end, Saul and his descendants missed out on a blessing of being in charge of the kingdom of Israel because of his disobedience. His disobedience was so unnecessary and so very costly. What are some things we learn from this account, about, from Saul in this account? The first thing is this, the partial obedience is really disobedience. When Saul and his armies did not kill everything that breathed, they were already not obeyed. Number two, delayed obedience is really disobedience. He was going to have to kill King Agag. He was going to have to kill everything else that they saved, but delaying it was disobedience. Number three, lying does not cover up our disobedience. Anybody who's had kids or has, currently has kids, you know when your kids lie to you, it makes things worse. So I'm just going to advise you, younger people here, don't lie to your parents. They know all that. Amen. <laughs> It's true. Uh, one of our daughters had a problem with lying, and I would tell her, if you just fess up right away, your punishment will still be there, but it won't be as great as if you're lying to me. Well, she didn't quite figure that out most of the time, but it does make things worse. Verse four, or number four, casting blame does not excuse our disobedience. Saul, being the king, he was responsible before God for obedience not the army. And so he just cast the blame and said, well, the troops, they did that. 
Well, ultimately, he was in charge, but he was afraid of the troops. And Saul should have responded in repentance rather than disobedience. Number five, disobedience brings a curse and it affects others negatively. Saul's disobedience meant the kingdom of Israel was given to someone else. Of course, that was David, a man after God's own heart. And God said about David, he will do whatever I ask him to do. Disobedience is really an act of selfishness because it's all about me and what I want. Number six, disobedience is sin. It's not, oops, my bad. It's not, I messed up, I stumbled, I tripped. No, it's sin. And God hates sin. It's so important for us not to be like Saul, but to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who obeyed God. In Daniel chapter 3, most of us know this account, King Nebuchadnezzar had a huge gold statue built in his honor because he wanted to be worshipped and treated like a god. Verse 2 tells us that he sent a message out to all the leaders throughout Babylon, ordering them to come to the dedication of a statue. And like obedient little people, they all came to this dedication, and they just expected to have this unveiling and go, wow, ooh. But no, they were surprised. In verses 4 to 6, we read that a herald shouted, People of all races, nations, and languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the musical instruments, bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Anyone who refuses to obey will be immediately thrown into a blazing furnace. When these men heard this command, they knew that it would be wrong for them to worship anything or anyone other than the Lord their God. They would not bow even if it meant death. When the music played, the Bible says, all the people bowed down, and you've got to read a couple more verses, and then it says, except for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Some of the other wise men went to the king and said, O oh, king, these three Hebrews didn't bow down. You better throw them in the furnace because they disobeyed you. King got very angry. But it's interesting because the herald said that they were going to be thrown in immediately to the fiery furnace. But the king called these three men before him to give them a second chance. Why would he do that? Well, I believe that the king knew that these three men, along with Daniel, who is not mentioned in chapter 3, were the most loyal, trustworthy, and reliable among all of his wise men. He did not want to kill these three men. So he gave them a second chance. But I love their response in verses 17 and 18. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. Is your God able to save you? Yes. Able to save me, I know that. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. That's a statement of faith, people, but it's not a stupid faith that just says, well, you know, I'm just, I'm just believing that God's going to save me. You can believe it all you want. If God didn't speak to your heart, he's not going to save you from that. But they followed it up with this wise statement that says, even if he does not, and quite honestly, if they had died and gone to paradise, it would have been a better place than be with the king anyway. So, but even if he does not, we want to make it clear to your majesty that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you set up. They said it like it was. We will never do this. So the king got very angry, had the furnace heated seven times hotter, the soldiers that threw the men died, but these three men were soon walking around in the fire with a fourth man because God had rescued them. What are some things we learned from this account? The first one is that complete obedience to God honors him. Even though they were threatened with sure death, these men did not compromise and continue to follow God and his commands. God took care of them. Now, I want to tell you this, that if you are going to go into a fiery furnace, this is not a promise that God's going to take you out of there and you're going to live, all right? You understand that, right? It's one story in the Bible. What it does promise is that God is going to be with you when you're in that fire. 
Number two, honesty about our obedience to God helps others learn of Him. As these three men told the king with the other people listening why they were not going to worship the statue, they demonstrated a faith in God that these people had never ever seen before. None of them, including the king, or especially the king, could trust another person or another God to the level that these men trusted their God. And when God delivered them, it was a very clear testimony that there was definitely a power greater than that of King Nebuchadnezzar. Number three, obedience before God is the most important. These men were standing before the most powerful king on the earth at that time. And they realized that it doesn't matter what this king wants. Someday I'm going to stand before the king of kings and the lord of lords. And I need to do what he wants me to do rather than what this king wants me to do. We don't have to be afraid of people. Obedience is my responsibility. Unlike Saul, who blamed other people for his disobedience, these men took responsibility and they obeyed God. They didn't look for Daniel. Oh no, Daniel's not in Babylon. What are we going to do? Instead, they just decided not to disobey. Number five, obedience brings a blessing and affects others negatively. These men obeyed God, which was really an act of selflessness, even though they could have died, because they understood that God blesses us and others through us when we obey. I really believe the nation of Babylon was blessed because of these men. Now for our story. In January, the Russians were building troops up around Ukraine in Belarus and on the western side of Russia. And the U.S. Embassy in Kiev was suggesting that we as Americans get out. Eh, suggestion. What do you do? You just kind of ignore it, right? It's a suggestion. And God spoke to my heart that we would not be leaving soon, although I had no idea what soon meant. That was going to be, you know, a long time, a short time. We didn't know. <coughs> End of January, the U.S. Embassy started recommending that Americans leave. There were seven Assemblies of God World missionary families in Ukraine at the time, and five of them left. They all had kids, they were living in Kiev and Odessa, so I, we totally understand why, but we were kind of left going, do we miss a memo? Were we supposed to run? It just, it felt kind of weird for us because we were still there. Not only that, uh, we had people in America writing to us regularly saying, when are you leaving? What's the matter with you? Why are you still there? We heard through some people that people were saying we were nuts because we were staying. And uh, that was kind of tough. My stepmom, my dad died a year, half, a year and a half ago, or two years in February it will be. And uh, she wrote to me in January, and she's like, are you coming home soon? And I said, uh, not till God says. So she kept writing me every two or three days. Heard anything yet? I had to write back, no, didn't. And uh, then Saturday, February 12th, this is 12 days before the war started, we were talking about our situation. We thought, well, maybe we're just being selfish because it's really hard to think about leaving our Ukrainian family or Ukrainian friends. Maybe we should go ahead and think about our family, the nieces, elderly parents, our two adult daughters, um, other family members, you know, I got five sisters and whatever. Maybe we should think about these other people instead of us. And so we decided to start packing. Just maybe it's time to just do something. So how it played out was very interesting because the first thing that I noticed is that we both lost our peace. We were miserable. Just miserable. And it was a struggle. Everything was difficult. And I know that emotions play tricks on us. So I just thought maybe that was just because, you know, whatever. So I just kind of ignored it and kept on packing. And it should have been a sign of disobedience. In the afternoon, then he started crying and said, it just feels wrong. Well, that's because it was wrong. And, but before we went to bed, we figured out that it was wrong. And I repented and said, oh, God, forgive me. We're going to stay. But during the day, I checked on ticket prices. So it was Saturday. We were talking about flying out on Tuesday. And I checked on ticket prices, and, but I, I didn't have enough peace to spend money to buy tickets. I can pack, that's one thing, but spending money, that's another one. So we'll just hold off. And before supper, tickets were about $750 a piece, one way from uh, Kiev to Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And then 
After supper, they jumped to $1,250. They increased $500 because one airline decided, you know what, we're not going to fly in and out of Kiev anymore. It's too risky. And then it was like, then he said, well, I guess we're not going then. So, no, we're not. We don't want to spend that kind of money. So we just decided we'll stay. But we were still packing in the evening. And I wrote to a classmate of mine who's like a sister to me. And I said, I just wish God would give us a clear answer. Anybody else ever said that? You want to hear a voice from God? Phil, turn to the right. Seven steps and then turn left. Does that ever happen to you? No, I've never had that happen to me. Yes, I know God could speak audibly, but the voice that I hear from God is really quiet in here. And I've got to be quiet and still to be able to hear his voice. And she answered back when I expressed that to her. I said, she said, is no answer not an answer? And I'm like, man, I'm an idiot. Of course that's right. If you're in the military and you lose contact with your commanding officer, you keep fulfilling your last standing orders, correct? I'm in the army of God. If I have not heard from God, then I need to keep doing what I have been supposed to be doing. So we decided we'll stay. In the morning, Denise said, my peace is back. And mine was too. Went and had a great service, ministry. It was just a fun day. And after that experience, I'm like, i got to write something on Facebook to let people know we're staying. And so I wrote, we do not know how long we are staying, but it will be for a while yet. We do not understand why God wants us here, but we're willing to stay. We are not trying to be heroes. We're just trying to be obedient. We cannot fight against God. And I really thought I'd get some flack about that, but I got so much support. you got to obey God. you got to do what God says. February 22nd, two days before the war started, we drove to Kiev and back again. Why would we drive to Kiev if there was a threat of a war? Well, you see, we had a problem. Our Speed the Light car was titled in the name of the seminary in Kiev, not in my name. That meant we could not drive our car out of the country. We needed a special document, which we also did not have. When we had registered in the fall, I wanted to do all that, but we couldn't because the president of the seminary was back in America. So Denise didn't find out about that till January. She's like, we got to do something. And I said, I already tried everything that I could. Nothing we can do. So we thought, well, maybe we'll have to buy a used car just to get us to the border and dump it or whatever. We didn't know. But we got to drive to Kiev two days before the war started because the president of the sem seminary came back and we got to transfer the title in my name. That's a miracle. If we had been disobedient and flown out on Tuesday the 15th of February, we would have missed seeing that miracle happened. We would have missed his hand of provision. Because then, we had a way out. God always provides a way out. And uh, we left Kiev 36 hours before the war started. That was a little too close looking back. But God is never late. He's always right on time. And we are grateful because now our car is in Romania being a blessing to some other missionaries whenever they need to use it. And it's safe. I don't have to worry about it getting bombed, getting stolen or destroyed. God is faithful. I, I don't even give it a second thought. The other thing that God does for us, you know, even if you forget a blanket when God speaks to you, which I wish we had had, but I was just as guilty of that because my wife kept telling me, and I read it a couple times too, that we needed to buy some gas cans and have gas in them in case of a war, because there may not be enough gas to get, you know, very far. Well, God provided anyway, and he still takes care of us even in our stupidity, okay? Just, I want you to know that. Because we're not always wise as, as we should be. My wife said, you should do that. I said, yeah, I know, but war's not going to happen, so I didn't do it. So, uh, the war started. Our leadership told us we needed to come back as soon as we could do it safely. We took care of some business for two days, and we left Saturday morning the 26th, two days after the war started. And on Friday, our landlady's ex-husband helped us find two gas cans. He bought one from somebody else that I paid him back for and just gave me one of his old ones. And the old one was so bad that I had to put saran wrap and a rubber band around the cap to make sure the gas didn't spill all over the car. But 
hey, it held five gallons. The only challenge with those gas cans was that they were the old metal ones, so the jerry cans, you know, about yay high, yay deep, yay wide, and heavy without gas, and uh, no nice little spout like we have in America. So we brought a funnel from the kitchen, and of course, you know, the funnel has, you know, the spout like that. So I got to hold the gas can, which I couldn't see where I was pouring, and Denise was holding the funnel, getting gas in her hands. And we did that two different times in the process of going west. And she would say, more and more, less, less. Okay, okay, okay. And then finally we were done and we left the gas can and off we went and did it again. But God provided for us. He took care of us. We even were able to buy gas closer to the border because God took care of us. And it doesn't matter what it is. If we obey God, he will bless us. Not in maybe in light form, not like he did for somebody else, but he always blesses us. And the one thing I want to tell you he blessed us with was we had peace. From the time we packed, because the war started, until we left and got it into Romania, we had peace the whole time. Why? Because we were being obedient to what God wanted us to do. Amen. Don't feel sorry for us. We left the house full of stuff. My keyboard grew legs um, while we've been gone, so I found that out in September. And it's only stuff. We have insurance, it'll cover part of it. Whatever, it's not a big deal. I, we got robbed a couple times, so it doesn't even phase me anymore. It's just one of those things. But I want to tell you that God is faithful. We never felt like we were in danger, but we know it's because people were praying for us that we had peace. So many people were concerned about us as we were exiting. We even had somebody in our organization that was concerned about us, watching us as we, uh, as we traveled on. And when we didn't have internet one night, everybody was concerned about us. Ever heard of the Marines? But obedience brings blessing, even if the process of obedience is not easy, and often it is not. God has always had everything under control. His plans for us, just like for you, are always good. It may not look good at the time, may not feel good at the time, but his plans for us is, are good. When I had cancer, I had peace. I never cried, I never, never screamed to God, I never got mad at him. I'm like, okay, God, this is my, this is my my thing I have to go through. And God was faithful the whole time. And I got to go share in Ukraine after we got back in, the, in June of 21 that God always keeps his promises. God's always with us in here. He gives us his peace. It's so important. There's three qualities of those, and this is your chance to think about how you can respond to what I've been sharing today. There's three qualities of those who can overcome the giant of disobedience. The first one is this, having a personal relationship with God. Pastor Michael was talking earlier that he believes there's somebody here who needs to know Jesus, that needs to say today, I need Jesus. It's to quit fighting and running from God. If that's you today, I'm just going to ask you to be bold. Wave your hand at me. Is there somebody here like that that needs to know Jesus? God loves you. He's searching for you. He wants a relationship with you. Is there anybody? If you're too bashful, come find me after church. Come find Pastor Micah, all right? But it's so important that you have that relationship with God because you can't obey him if you don't know him. The second thing is fearing God more than men. We have to get used to, and I'm still struggling with this, to not being afraid of what people think, but to do what God wants us to do. If you have a fear of man, I want to pray with you after service. Just come find me. But I want you to be able to overcome that fear. And number three is this. There's people who can... Obey God, develop a habit of choosing obedience rather than disobedience. Nobody's perfect, but we want to trend more on the obedience side. And today is the day for you to confess that sin to God and say, God, I need strength to overcome the giants in my life. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your love, God. I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for your help in being obedient, God. I pray that you would help each one, each person here, God, my, myself included, to be able to obey you 
with all of our hearts, God. That we would do what you ask us to do, even if it's uncomfortable, because I know you don't care about our comfort, but you care about our character and our obedience, God. Help us to serve you with all of our heart, God. Help every person here to search their hearts today, God, and just say, boy, I think I, I really, I'm really not doing like I'm supposed to do. God, forgive me for that. Help me to change, God. God, bless Pastor Mike and Pastor Laura. Bless their family, God. Bless this church. May it be a lighthouse to reach the community and communities around here, Jesus. I'm so grateful for them, God, and for what you're doing in this, in this church, God, in this body. Help each one of us to do what you ask us to do, God, that corporately we can be obedient as well, Jesus. And your precious name, we thank you, God. Amen.